The next morning they were busy packing another cart with the remainder of the luggage. Mary took charge of this and drove off with Fatty, that is, Fredegar Bolger. Someone must get there and warm the house before you arrive, said Mary. <sighs> well, see you later. The day after tomorrow if you don't go to sleep on the way. Falco went home after lunch, but Pippin remained behind. Frodo was restless and anxious, listening in vain for a sound of Gandalf. He decided to wait until nightfall. After that, if Gandalf wanted him urgently, he would go to Crick Hollow, and might even get there first, for Frodo was going on foot. His plan, for pleasure and a last look of the Shire as much as any other reason, was to walk from Hobbiton to Buckleberry Ferry, taking it fairly easy. Whew, I shall get myself a bit into training too, he said, looking at himself in a dusty mirror in the half-empty hall. <sighs> he had not done any strenuous walking for a long time, and the reflection looked rather flabby, he thought. <sighs> After lunch, the Sackville Bagginses, Lobelia and her sandy-haired son Lotho, turned up, much to Frodo's annoyance. Ours yes. oh, at last, said Lobelia as she stepped inside. It was not polite nor strictly true, for the sale of Bag End did not take effect until midnight. But Lobelia can perhaps be forgiven. She had been obliged to wait about seventy-seven years longer for Bag End than she once hoped. And she was now a hundred years old. Anyway, she had come to see that nothing she had paid for had been carried off, and she wanted the keys. It took a long while to satisfy her, as she had brought a complete inventory with her and went right through it. In the end, she departed with Lotho and the spare key, and the promise that the other key would be left at the Gamgees in Bagshot Row. She snorted, and showed plainly that she thought the Gamgees capable of plundering the hole during the night. Frodo did not offer her any tea. He took his own tea with Pippin and Sam Gamgee in the kitchen. It had been officially announced that Sam was coming to Buckland to do for Mr. Frodo and look after his bit of garden, an arrangement that was approved by the gaffer though it did not console him for the prospect of having Lobelia as a neighbour. <sighs> Our last meal at Bag End, said Frodo, pushing back his chair. They left the washing up for Lobelia. Pippin and Sam strapped up their three packs and piled them in the porch. Ah, there we go. Pippin went out for a last stroll in the garden. Sam disappeared. The sun went down. Bag End seemed sad and gloomy and dishevelled. Frodo wandered round the familiar rooms, and saw the light of the sunset fade on the walls, and shadows creep out of the corners. It grew slowly dark indoors. He went out and walked down to the gate at the bottom of the path, and then on a short way down the hill road. He half expected to see Gandalf come striding up through the dusk. The sky was clear and the stars were growing bright. It's going to be a fine night, he said aloud. That's good for a beginning. I feel like walking. I can't bear any more hanging about. I'm going to start. And Gandalf must follow me. He turned to go back and then stopped, for he heard voices just round the corner by the end of Bagshot Row. One voice was certainly the old gaffer's. The other was strange and somehow unpleasant. He could not make out what it said, but he heard the gaffer's answers, which were rather shrill. The old man seemed put out. No, Mr. Baggins has gone away. Went this morning, and my Sam went with him. And anyway, all his stuff went. Yet sold out and gone, I tell ye. But why? Why's one of my business or yours? Where to? That ain't no secret. He's moved to Bucklebury or some such place, away down yonder. Y yes, y yes it is, a, a tidy way. I've never been so far myself, they queer folks in Buckland. No, I can't give no message. Good night to you. Footsteps went away down the hill. Frodo wondered vaguely why the fact that they did not come up on the hill seemed a great relief. I am sick of questions and curiosity about my doings, I suppose, he thought. What an inquisitive lot they all are. He had half a mind to go and ask the gaffer who the inquirer was, but he thought better, or worse of it, and turned and walked quickly back to Bag End. Pippin was sitting on his pack in the porch. Sam was not there. Frodo stepped inside the dark door, 
Sam? He called. Sam! Time! Coming, sir! Came the answer from far within, followed soon by Sam himself, wiping his mouth. He had been saying farewell to the beer barrel in the cellar. All aboard, Sam, said Frodo. Yes, sir. I'll ask for a bit now, sir. Frodo shut and locked the round door, and gave the key to Sam. Run down with this to your home, Sam, he said. Then cut along the row and meet us as quick as you can at the gate in the lane beyond the meadows. <laughs> We're not going through the village tonight. Too many ears pricking and eyes prying. <laughs> Sam ran off at full speed. <laughs> Well, now we're off at last, said Frodo. They shouldered their packs and took up their sticks and walked round the corner to the west side of Bag End. Goodbye, said Frodo, looking at the dark blank windows. He waved his hand and then turned and following Bilbo if he had known it, hurried after Peregrine down the garden path. They jumped over the low place in the hedge at the bottom and took to the fields, passing into the darkness like a rustle in the grasses. At the bottom of the hill on its western side they came to the gate opening on to a narrow lane. There they halted and adjusted the straps for their packs. Presently Sam appeared, trotting quickly and breathing hard. His heavy pack was hoisted high on his shoulders, and he had put on his head a tall shapeless fell bag which he called a hat. In the gloom, he looked very much like a dwarf. I'm sure you have given me all the heaviest stuff, said Frodo. I pity snails, and all that carry their homes on their backs. I could take a lot more yet, sir. My packet is quite light, said Sam stoutly and untruthfully. No, you don't, Sam, said Pippin. It is good for him. He's got nothing except what he ordered us to pack. He's been slack lately. And he'll feel the weight less when he's walked off some of his own. <laughs> be kind to a poor old hobbit, laughed Frodo. I shall be as thin as a willow wand, I'm sure, before I get to Buckland. But I was talking nonsense. I suspect you have taken more than your share, Sam. And I shall look into it at our next packing. He picked up his stick again. Well, we all like walking in the dark, he said. So let's put some miles behind us before bed. For a short way, they followed the lane westwards. Then leaving it, they turned left and took quietly to the fields again. They went in single file, along hedgerows and the borders of carpuses, and night fell dark about them. In their dark cloaks, they were as invisible as if they all had magic rings. Since they were all hobbits, and were trying to be silent, they made no noise that even hobbits would hear. Even the wild things in the fields and woods hardly noticed their passing. After some time, they crossed the water, west of Hobbiton, by a narrow plank bridge. The stream was there no more than a winding black ribbon, bordered with leaning Ardler trees. A mile or two further south, they hastily crossed the great road from the Brandywine Bridge. They were now in the Tukland, and bending southeastwards, they made for the Green Hill country. As they began to climb its first slopes, they looked back and saw the lamps in Hobbiton far off twinkling in the gentle valley of the water. Soon it disappeared in the folds of the darkened land, and was followed by Bywater beside its grey pool. When the light of the last farm was far behind, peeping among the trees, Frodo turned and waved a hand in farewell. <sighs> I wonder if I shall ever look down into that valley again, he said quietly. When they had walked for about three hours, they rested. The night was clear, cool and starry, but smoke-like wisps of mist were creeping up the hillsides from the streams and deep meadows. Thin-clad birches swaying in a light wind above their heads made a black net against the pale sky. They ate a very frugal supper, for hobbits, and then went on again. Soon they struck a narrow road that went rolling up and down, fading grey into the darkness ahead. The road to Woodhole and Stock and the Buckleberry Ferry. It climbed away from the main road in the water valley and wound over the skirts of the green hills towards Woody End, a wild corner of the East Farthing. After a while they plunged into a deeply cloven track between tall trees that rustled their dry leaves in the night. It was very dark. At first they talked, or hummed a tune softly together, being now far away from inquisitive ears. Then they marched on in silence 
and Pippin began to lag behind. At last they began to climb a steep slope. He stopped and yawned. I am so sleepy, he said, that soon I shall fall down on the road. Are you going to sleep on your legs? It's nearly midnight. I thought you liked walking in the dark, said Frodo. But there is no great hurry. Mary expects us sometime the day after tomorrow, but that leaves us nearly two days more. We'll halt at the first likely spot. The wind's in the west, said Sam. If we get to the other side of this hill, we shall find a spot that is sheltered and snug enough, sir. There is a dry fir wood just ahead, if I remember rightly. Sam knew the land well within twenty miles of Hobbiton, but that was the limit of his geography. Just over the top of the hill, they came on the patch of fir wood. Leaving the road, they went into the deep, resin-scented darkness of the trees and gathered dead sticks and cones to make a fire. Soon they had a merry crackle of flame at the foot of a large fir tree, and they sat round it for a while, until they began to nod. Then, each in an angle of the great tree's roots, they curled up in their cloaks and blankets, and were soon fast asleep. They set no watch. Even Frodo feared no danger yet, for they were still in the heart of the Shire. A few creatures came and looked at them, when the fire had died away. A fox, passing through the wood on business of his own, stopped several minutes and sniffed. Hobbits? He thought. Well, what's next? I have heard of strange doing in this land, but I seldom heard of a hobbit sleeping outdoors under a tree. Three of them. There's something mighty queer behind this. He was quite right, but he never found out any more about it.